I guess I know time is tight. Uh, I'm pleased to be convening the first meeting of this session between the conveners group and the First Minister, and I'd like to welcome the First Minister and the conveners to this meeting today. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's come along to watch the session today. In particular, can I welcome Essex pupils from Perth Grammar School and the staff and volunteers from Rowan Alba, a charity helping homeless people. I understand that our Perth Grammar School contingent need to leave early, so you mustn't take it personally when they get up to go. It's all prearranged. Um, before I proceed further, can I just remind conveners, the total time you have, because time is tight, is five minutes. That's for your questions, responses from the First Minister, and any other question you want to ask. If there's spare time, I can take supplementaries from other conveners within that, but I will have to keep to five minutes. I myself must leave at 10 to 2 as I'm chairing the chamber. So that's how tight we are for time. Uh, that said, can I ask the First Minister if she wants to make a brief opening remark? Well, in the interest of time, uh, Presiding Officer, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'll simply say thank you for giving me this opportunity. As I think everybody is aware, um, I'm keen that these sessions become more regular. Um, I think they're an important part of the government's accountability to Parliament. And on the, I think, two occasions that I have uh, previously appeared before the Committee of Conveners, I've certainly found it also a very useful experience. Um, this is the first session since the election, obviously. Um, the period since the election inevitably has been dominated by Brexit. That's not of our choosing or our making, but it is unavoidable given the interests that are at stake. But notwithstanding that, we as a government remain very focused on progressing our programme for government and I would expect that much of our discussion today will cover uh, the different aspects of that programme for government. So with those very brief uh, remarks I'm happy to get on with questions. Uh, thank you very much and can I tell conveners your button will come on automatically when you're called. I start with James Dorn, the convener of education and skills. Mr. Thank Dorn. you convener and uh, good afternoon first minister. The education and skills committee is planning to hold a session with local authorities focusing on their role as education authorities soon. For example, to explore why diagnosis rates for additional support needs in different local authority areas are so notably distinct, potentially due to different approaches taken by different councils. And in education more broadly, the OECD has challenged Scotland to have more collaboration in education, and this must include between councils as education authorities. Other areas where councils are crucial to government policy delivery include, of course, <coughs> provision of funded childcare. Now, in light of the importance of councils' roles in the education of the children and to inform the committee's planned session with councils, how is the Scottish Government working to ensure government priorities in education and beyond for children and young people can be delivered by councils? Well, obviously, we work very closely with local authorities on an ongoing basis, both in general terms but also around specific priorities. So, childcare, for example, uh, both in terms of the... Uh, current commitment of uh, 600 hours and in terms of planning for our transformational change to childcare, that dialogue with local authorities is very important. In terms of education more generally, uh, councils are and will continue to be key players in the delivery of education. Uh, the Deputy First Minister has made clear in the context of the Education Governance Review that councils will retain uh, democratic oversight of education and that's as it should be. But the governance review, as members will be aware, is very much about making sure that responsibility and decision-making in education it lies at the right levels. Right now, we have a system where councils very much sit at the centre. They have statutory responsibility um, and they will continue to be key players. But what we want to try to do is uh, get more decision-making at the level of individual schools. So the governance review is based on the presumption of decisions unless there's a good reason for it to be otherwise being taken at, at school level and the governance review of course is running until the start of January and that very much uh, will influence uh, the, the overall governance of education and the place of local councils and the relationship between local councils and central government. Uh, we're also within that governance review, of course, uh, not just looking at how we empower schools, because much of the evidence says empowering schools is key to raising standards and tackling the attainment gap, but also uh, we'll look at how we respond to the OECD's recommendations, for example, about strengthening the middle, which is the, the technical term for that. So we're looking at uh, the, the concept of uh, education regions, for example, allowing local authorities to work together where appropriate and share best practice and some of the variation and some of what you asked me in your question there is, is part of what we're looking to address through that, but also enabling schools to work in clusters. Um, so that's what the governance review is all about and that is going to 
obviously have an influence on how uh, government works with local councils and how local councils work uh, with schools, but councils are and will continue to be key players in education delivery. Uh, uh, thank you for that response. But the, one of the other areas, well, one of the areas of concern, I suppose, which is touched on there is that clearly the government gives local authorities a considerable amount of money and there are tasks that are expected to be fulfilled through that. The early years funding one was uh, the latest example of government, government money not being utilised according to the, the, the figures accordingly. But I'm not sure it's the only example. What, what can the government do or what is the government intending to do to make sure that the money that the local authorities are given are spent in the way that we would wish it to be spent? Well, that, that's part of an overall um, relationship we have with uh, local councils. Now, as people are aware when we took office, one of the things we did through the Local Government Concordat was remove much of the ring fencing around uh, local government expenditure. And you know, that therefore leads to a different relationship of accountability in terms of spend. But there are also uh, parts of local government spend where, uh, if I can simplify it, the money you know, is, is only uh, received by councils if uh, the commitments that it uh, is intended to to fund are delivered. So teacher numbers, for example, the, the council tax freeze over the uh, duration of our government have been two examples of how uh, the, the money is not passed over unless the commitments are uh, delivered. Now, you know, those arrangements can often be controversial in councils for reasons I can understand, prefer not to have those kinds of uh, conditionality and, and in some respects sanctions applied to, to budgets. But as, as government, we have a responsibility to the electorate and to the taxpayer to make sure that if we are funding a particular commitment, then we can look taxpayers in the eye and see that that commitment is being delivered. You mentioned uh, childcare. We did a financial review of the childcare commitments uh, to date, and that found, and I'm, I'm simply stating this as a fact, that are, as I'm sure councils would uh, point out if they were around this table, there will be a number of factors involved in this. Uh, but the, the money that had been uh, given to councils as part of their overall settlement for the expansion of funded hours to 600 uh, had not been matched in all councils by uh, an increase in expenditure on childcare. So, you know, that leads to uh, a conclusion that the childcare uh, commitment hasn't, uh, yeah, supposed to be, again, to simplify it, been overfunded. So these are discussions we have with councils on a, an ongoing basis. And, you know, as First Minister, as leader of the government, um, I take very seriously the the, the accountability we have to the public and you know that means that where we are funding something that is a statutory responsibility of the council we've got to have that discussion and that relationship to make sure that that money has been spent appropriately and delivering the right outcomes okay thank you very much thank you i move on to margaret mitchell convener of justice Ms. mitchell please uh, good afternoon first minister committees haven't operated as they were envisaged since the inception of the the parliament they were hailed as the the jewel in the crown, sadly, they've fallen far short of that. For example, in November 1997, the Consultative Steering Group on the new Scottish Parliament was set up, and one of the key recommendations at that time for strong parliamentary committees was the power to introduce their own legislation, and this was uh, heralded as a striking departure from the position at Westminster and intended to embody the principle that power should be shared between the government and parliament. So almost 20 years later from setting up this consultative steering group, why do, do you think we seem to be so very far away from that vision of committees and government sharing the initiative of bringing forward legislation in particular? Um, in terms of the, I suppose, the general thrust of the question about the performance of committees, I'm, I'm sitting in front of committee conveners here, so I'm going to be quite careful what I say about the performance of committees. Um, I, I'm not sure I would entirely agree with that. I, I think we've got some fantastic examples uh, throughout the life of this parliament of committees, including the committee you chair uh, previously, I think chaired by uh, the deputy presiding officer here, uh, doing lots of very uh, good, meaningful work and, you know, very powerfully and visibly holding the government to account. And, uh, you know, I think that's something to be proud of. I equally think we always have to be looking at how we further strengthen those arrangements. And, of course, the presiding officer has established a group to look particularly at refreshing the some of the arrangements that the Parliament works by so that those arrangements work well. I'm, I'm slightly hesitant, I suppose, to, to, to comment too much. As a member of the government uh, who is uh, here to be held to account by committees, I'm, I'm slightly hesitant to be telling committees how they should be doing their work. One of the things as government uh, we are mindful of um, and 
uh, this has been raised previously, I think it was raised by Christine Graham in a, a previous session, is that if the, the government legislative timetable is such that committees are very tied up with that, and that was a, an issue for a, a previous justice committee, then they don't have the time that they might like to do their own inquiries or to introduce legislation. So there are issues there about management of, of government business to try to make sure committees do have that time. But you know, there's, there's no, you know, what, what committees choose to do in terms of what subjects the committees choose to look into, what you know, if any pieces of legislation they choose to initiate is not a matter for me or, or for the government. That's very much a matter for individual committees. And, you know, the government can't uh, stand in the way of a committee that wants to do uh, an inquiry uh, or, or, or any other piece of work into any other particular issue. I think um, the point, First Minister, is that, as you rightly said, the last Justice Committee in particular, I think in 18 months we covered something like 13 bills, which was a, a ridiculous amount of legislation and the, the scrutiny just couldn't possibly be there at stage threes. So isn't there an onus on the government and you as First Minister to look at the legislative timetable, to look at what is being yeah. passed at stage three? Sometimes some hugely important um, aspects are brought up in an amendment at stage three and discussed in the 10 minute um, debate in the Parliament and that surely can't be a satisfactory situation for you or for um, anyone else affected by this legislation. Uh, that's a very general question. That kind of thing doesn't happen in every piece of legislation. There will be particular uh, factors and circumstances uh, involved in some pieces of legislation where amendments are, are brought forward at a later stage. That's, I have to say, not always by government. That is often by uh, opposition parties or other members. You know, on, on the question of, uh, I suppose, weight of legislation, you know, I've, I've reluctantly come to the conclusion after almost 10 years in government that governments are damned if they do, damned if, if they don't. It's, it's only about a week, I think, where the government was being criticised, may I say it, by your party about not having brought forward enough legislation since uh, the election. Now, actually, one of the reasons for that, not the only reason, but one of the reasons for that has been our discussions with individual committees about timetabling of legislation to allow committees to do their work. So it strikes me, and you know, I'm not complaining here, it's a, a feature of, I, I guess, the, the inevitable and, uh, did I say, creative and, and healthy tension between governments and, and committees that you know, will be criticised for bringing forward too much legislation or criticised for bringing forward too little. What I can absolutely give a commitment around is that the Minister for Parliamentary Business will always seek to work uh, constructively with committees to make sure that we strike the right balance between the government fulfilling its legislative commitments and committees being able to perform a good scrutiny role, which I think committees in this parliament by and large do, uh, but also giving committees the time and the space to initiate pieces of work in areas of interest. Sandra White, Convener of Social Security, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Good afternoon, uh, First Minister. Uh, you mentioned legislation, and obviously the uh, Social Security Committee is looking at legislation and Social Security Bill, which uh, is one of the largest pieces of legislation to go through the Parliament at this particular term, and it does affect, at one point, possibly all of the population of, of Scotland. So can I therefore ask when you think this Parliament will be ready uh, or in a position to, to deliver these powers which are to be devolved? And if I can put a supplementary into that, you mentioned the fact about committees being given time for scrutiny. Uh, can you give myself and my committee assurances that our committee will have ample time to scrutinise all legislation, whether it be secondary or, or, or otherwise, uh, going through and pertaining to the Social Security Bill? Um, in, in, in relation to the second part of your question, first, uh, the short answer to that is yes, although behind that short answer there will require to be a lot of discussion and dialogue between uh, the government, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, his officials and the committee to make sure that that is the case, because you're absolutely right to highlight the Social Security Bill, both as one of the most important pieces of legislation that this session of Parliament will pass, but also one of the most complex uh, in terms of making sure we get the legislative underpinning for what is a, a massive delivery undertaking absolutely right. Now, there will be uh, primary legislation, as you say, in, in the next year uh, to do that, but there will also be a lot of secondary legislation that flows from that. So it is absolutely essential, and it's, you know, it, it is in the government's interest that there is time for the committee to perform a really good scrutiny role around that. In terms of the first part of your question, as uh, we have said uh, repeatedly, as uh, the, the Minister for Social Security set out again yesterday in Parliament, uh, we will have a, a Scottish Social Security 
agency uh, with a, a delivery system uh, fully up and running, delivering the range of benefits that are being devolved uh, by the end of this parliamentary session. That has always been the case. Uh, I think it is worth, and you know, Jean Freeman laid this out to your committee, I think at the end of September, uh, Angela Constance previously, uh, and there has been a lot of discussion around this. Uh, the, the scale and the complexity of what we're doing here means that, yes, we want to get these powers up and running as quickly as possible, but the absolute driving priority is to deliver them safely and securely so that every single person that is eligible for a payment that will in future be delivered by the Scottish Government gets that payment uh, exactly in the amount they should get it and at the time they should get it. In terms of the, the scale of that, uh, and, and this uh, statistic, I think, uh, is one of many statistics that could illustrate the scale. When this system is fully up and running, uh, it will deliver more payments per week than the Scottish Government currently delivers in total every year. So that's the, the scale of it. It will deliver payments to 1.4 million people, about one in four of the Scottish population. Now, that scale is massive. The complexity of it is also significant. Uh, we are taking responsibility for about 15% of the current welfare spend. And that means extracting, extricating rather, that 15% from uh, the, the, the remainder of the reserved responsibilities that are staying reserved. Uh, we have to do that uh, dealing with and interacting with DWP systems that are often pretty antiquated uh, and a, a, a welfare system that is itself under significant reform. And just one example of the complexity of that, cold weather payments uh, right now uh, the, the payment of cold weather payments relies on 11 different DWP yes. IT systems. Uh, now, each one of them is going to have to be amended to identify Scottish recipients. And we will also have to, as we design the system, make sure, because we're not taking uh, control... Counterintuitively, our task would probably be easier if we were taking over the welfare system wholesale. Uh, but because we're taking over 15% of it, we've got to make sure that our systems dovetail properly with the remaining reserve systems so that there's no unintended consequences, that if we make a change in, to benefits, then that doesn't, in an unintended way, have a knock-on effect to, to other benefits that are, are still reserved. So it's a massive task. It's a complex task. We want to get it up and running as quickly as possible, but we cannot... Uh, take responsibility for delivering these systems until we have the delivery mechanism in place that we are confident can deliver. We don't want to make the mistakes of universal credit, which has uh, over-promised and under-delivered almost since the, the very day it was announced. Yes, I'd like you have a short supplementary. A very that's short, quite a full answer. Yeah, a very short supplementary. <clears throat> you mentioned about the complexity, absolutely correct, and also the cold weather payments. But there's another issue under <clears throat> funeral payments, which affects a lot of people, which is at the moment paper-based. And I wonder if the First Minister would look into that in regards to data. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we're having to look at all of these things. So, you know, again, this is not shouldn't be taken as a... A criticism of the DWP, I, I criticise the DWP for plenty of things, but you know, they, their systems have developed over many, many years um, and uh, they're, they're disjointed. Some of them are, are, are automated, some like funeral payments are still largely paper-based. So we, we're having to firstly understand all of that, work out how we extricate the 15% from the totality and make sure we have the proper planning and design of a new system uh, properly undertaken here in Scotland. So that at the moment, uh, you know, and, and there'll be parts of this that may come on stream earlier than, than other parts, uh, and in fullness of time, we'll be able to set out, you know, delivery dates mm. for each of the different benefits that we're taking responsibility for. But at the moment at which we switch on this system for any benefit, we have to be sure it can deliver those benefits to everybody who's entitled to them. Uh, so, you know, when I've heard over the last few days about you know, the Scottish Government trying to delay this or, or you know, sort of delay taking responsibility, that is absolute, utter nonsense. Uh, this is about working to a time scale that we've always set out, understanding the complexity of the, the issues that we're dealing with. Thank you. Neil Finlay, Convener Health and Sport, please. Uh, Mr thanks. Finlay. Good afternoon. Almost uh, every witness uh, that comes before uh, my committee, except senior health board managers, civil servants and ministers, uh, and the people who we speak to in private briefings raise the issue of uh, cuts to health and social care services that is impacting on patients. Um, one of the doctors summed it up well when he said there appears to be a gulf between the strategies promoted by government and what actually happens in reality on the ground. 
Um, could you offer any explanation um, for that gulf existing? Um, I, I don't <coughs> accept that, that that is the case. I'm, I'm not sure what witness you're, you're referring to. I absolutely do accept that... Lot, the, lots of them. Well, let me answer your question. Um, I absolutely do accept, and, and this is something I was very conscious of when I was Health Secretary, that uh, often the relatively easy bit of a government's job is to come up with the strategy, to come up with the document, how that then translates and the, the relationships and the discussions and the dialogue and the hard work that has to be done to translate that into practice on the front line is, is the difficult bit, and that's where our frontline health <coughs> professionals uh, deserve so much uh, uh, of our gratitude. So, you know, there is a lot of work goes into that. I, am I sitting here saying we always get that right? And at a time of change for our health service, which is, and transition, which is what we're going through right now, the challenge of that is, is more significant. What, what we are doing in terms of health, firstly, we're making sure that health uh, gets uh, record funding. So the, the health service budget uh, under this government has gone up by £3 billion. We will increase it over the life of this parliament by a further £2 billion, £500 million more than the rate of inflation. There are record numbers of staff working in our health service, but as we all know, the demand for health services, largely because of changing demography, uh, are rising as well. Now, that then brings into sharp focus the need to change and reform the way we deliver services. The principal uh, piece of work we've done uh, around this, of course, so far is through the integration of health and social care, uh, and I'm very I'm aware from my own constituency uh, experience as well as my first ministerial experience that the, the work that's been done on the ground to turn integration, the, the, the legislative part of integration, into reality with proper strategic plans and the delivery of services in place is a monumental uh, undertaking, but I think that is uh, working well and those working in the front line are doing a, a fantastic job around that. So we have to make sure that we've got the right frameworks in place, the right funding in place, the right staffing numbers in place, and then support our health services to make changes. Sometimes, the, sometimes this will include controversial changes that get more services delivered in the community, closer to home, so that over time we can relieve some of the pressure on acute services. And as I say, that will involve difficult decisions at some time. And as I said in the chamber uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, there'll be moments of truth for all of us and whether we're prepared to face up to some of those difficult decisions. So the, um, <clears throat> from, you know, surgeons to doc doctors to nurses to uh, cleaners and uh, kitchen staff in our hospitals and, and in our social care field, um, we've heard this repeated time and again. Um, is is someone misleading them into believing that there are cuts to services happening? I, don't, I didn't accuse anybody of, of, of misleading. I, I understand very well the pressures that frontline health care staff work under. Um, that's always been the case in the health service because of some of the uh, issues driving increased demand. That is even more the case right now. So I'm not for a second denying the very real pressures that health service staff at all levels of the health service work under, um, nor am I denying the things that they, they say to, to your committee. I'm simply trying to uh, outline the task that that we all have, and as First Minister, uh, that I have principal responsibility for ensuring that we undertake to make sure that we fund our health service uh, as, as well as we can within the overall financial constraints we face, and that we support our health service to change in ways that the changing demands on it, uh, frankly, necessitate. Uh, and that is about integration of health and social care, getting more money out of the acute service into social care, which we've started that process with the £250 million transfer uh, this year, which we want to build on in future years. It's about making sure that we're building up primary care and, you know, we've already uh, also signalled our direction of travel in terms of transferring more of the health budget into primary care. It's about making sure that we invest properly in mental health care services. All of these services, that if we invest properly in them, will help to relieve or at least constrain the pressure on our uh, acute sector. Now, as I say, at times that will be difficult for staff. I fully understand that. At times it will uh, be difficult for politicians. But, you know, the health service in Scotland is not unique in this sense, that it faces challenges that are inescapable challenges. It's how we respond to those challenges that will determine how well our health service copes. And what I would say, just in my final uh, point here, is our health service, yes, it faces <coughs> challenges, but as the Auditor General said in the, the recent report, compared to other health services across the UK, for example, NHS Scotland is performing uh, well. Waiting times are lower than they were when this government took office. Patient safety is better. Uh, 
hospital infections have reduced uh, dramatically. Uh, we see hospital mortality reducing. So, you know, our health service is doing great things. What we've got to do is make sure we support it through the transition that lies ahead of it over the next few years to make sure it can continue to do great things. Yeah, a very short yes. supplement, if I so may ask first, it's a very short do, answer, please. Do you accept that the, the evidence that we are hearing is accurate? You, you hear a lot of evidence, um, and some of it I will uh, perhaps take a different view of. So if, if, if you want me to say, uh, I, what I'm not saying is anybody's coming to your committee and saying things that are, are not true, but, but you, you get a lot of evidence. Some of it I will agree with, some of it I will have a different interpretation of. So if you want to ask me about a particular bit of evidence, if I think it's accurate or I agree with it or not, I'll do that. But you know, that's a very, very general question. Thank you very much. Uh, Joan McAlpine, a convener of Culture, Tourism, European and External Relations. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, the European Committee is currently doing work on uh, the implications of the EU <coughs> referendum results. As you know, um, we're looking at the single market and alternative trading relationships. And this week, we're taking some evidence from Norwegian experts. Um, I'm aware and you'll be aware as well of media reports um, on uh, Norway as perhaps one of the alternatives that you're looking at and I wondered if you would comment on that. Um, I am obviously aware of media reports. Um, look, I mean, I've been very clear uh, that the, the priority we've been working uh, around just now is to look at how we maintain and protect our place in the single market and by that I mean membership of the single market not some you know vague access to the single market that um, you know other parties might talk about uh, but you know there are different ways that that could perhaps be achieved so I, I've set out very clearly I, I want the UK as a whole to stay in the single market and you know so the, to the extent that we can wield any influence UK-wide we will try to uh, help steer the UK government away from a hard Brexit towards staying in the single market. And in that respect, of course, the, the outcome of the Supreme Court Article 50 case will have relevance because it, it may, well, it will influence the extent to which the House of Commons is going to be able to influence this before the triggering of Article 50. Uh, but if the UK is intent on a hard Brexit and coming out of the single market, I want to look at uh, how we could, and I'm not uh, for a minute saying there wouldn't be challenges associated with this, but whether we could find a way of protecting Scotland's place in the single market. And of course, models like, uh, you know, EFTA, Norway uh, is in EFTA. EFTA countries, apart from uh, Switzerland, are also in the single market through the European economic area. So of course, these are models that we're looking at. And we will, as I've said uh, previously, publish uh, some proposals uh, and an option uh, or perhaps different options uh, about how this could be achieved, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. Right, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things that perhaps hasn't been looked at um, uh, in a great deal of depth is that um, you'll be aware that the, obviously the UK government are going around the world speaking to various governments. So we've seen the Prime Minister's visit to India and we're told that Liam Fox is globetrotting as well. Now, I'm aware that there are those visits have um, met with some degree of scepticism, but there's, a, there's an aspect to it that um, has been raised with us as a concern, is that UK ministers could be going around the world promising all sorts of things in these informal discussions with other governments on future trading relationships, and Scotland's not at the table in those discussions. Is that something that, that you have addressed, and how do you think that we should um, make sure that Scotland, you know, like, mm -hmm. our, our public sector and our private sector is protected um, from anything that they may be promising in these talks? I, mean, I think that's a very good question, and I, if I can just briefly uh, unpack it a little bit. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not sure, based on anything I've heard uh, thus far, that the, the various discussions UK government ministers are having overseas are shedding any great light on matters. Uh, although we do uh, sometimes uh, hear snippets from some of those discussions that seem to tell uh, people things that uh, the Prime Minister is not telling the House of Commons, you know, Boris Johnson yesterday apparently saying we're going to be out of the customs union where the Prime Minister stands up in the last hour in the House of Commons and, and doesn't, uh, isn't prepared to shed any light whatsoever on that. So um, I, I keep hoping I'm wrong about this, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure I am. <clears throat> I look at the various different things and uh, that UK government ministers are doing around Brexit just now and I'm not add, sure that any of it adds up to any kind of coherent plan for what it is they're, they're trying to achieve and, and, and that concerns me deeply. Um, but in terms of uh, your, your question about, you know, if it does uh, 
turn out to be the case that there are things being offered because at this stage, you know, offers can't be guaranteed because at some point there's going to be a negotiation and the UK government is only going to be one side of that negotiation. But if there are, you know, Nissan, for example, um, we still don't know what uh, has been offered to Nissan. Uh, it may well turn out to be the case that there are commitments or, or promises being made to other governments. And there is a lack of transparency around any of this right now. Um, and that's not just the case for, for Scotland. And, you know, it's not just a concern for our interests. I think that's more generally a concern about how the government is conducting this whole exercise just now. So I think there should be a lot more uh, openness and transparency around it. In terms of our place at the table, we are you know, continuing to work very hard to try to uh, influence the Article 50 negotiating position, the JMC uh, European negotiations, which met for the first time last week, is the, the multilateral forum uh, for that to happen. Let's just you know, stop it, it saying the jury's out and how effective that is going to be. It's been a bit of a struggle getting to this point. Um, there's also a bilateral uh, track of, of discussions that we're trying to make the most of as well. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose at this stage, you know, I, I feel frustrated at the, the inability to, to meaningfully influence things at this stage. But I think that's largely because, you know, we're influencing something or trying to influence something that doesn't really exist yet. The, the, there is no real sense of what the UK government's strategy is. And perhaps even more concerning, there's no real sense, and I, you know, it's a point I, I made at the JMC meeting a couple of weeks ago, there's no real sense of how they get from where they are right now to having a coherent negotiating strategy. Uh, so we are, we're trying to influence a bit of a vacuum at the moment, and it is extremely frustrating, but we'll keep trying as best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Crawford, Convener of Finance and Constitution. Mr Crawford, please. Good afternoon, First Minister. Just reflecting on some of the earlier comments made about committees, I'm sure the First Minister is aware that I've not been slow to hold the Scottish Government to account on budgetary matters. Um, but looking to the future, uh, this year's draft budget is historical, given that it will be the first time the Scottish Parliament has ever set uh, bans for income tax. I, I don't think yet we all appreciate just the historic nature of that. That will ra raise around £11 billion. It will dwarf previous devolved tax powers. It's going to bring huge changes. Uh, you'll also be aware, First Minister, we've established a tripartite working group to review the impact of these new powers on the budget process. These will be challenging and complex issues, that, that they're, and the, particularly around the potential volatility of the budget moving from a comparatively relatively fixed block grant from Westminster now to a tax raising parliament, and obviously the impact of Brexit on top of that. First Minister, um, in your view, what are the key principles which you think the group should be considered, given that we've got to establish and design a system that won't just deal with um, the change in circumstances, but be able to stand the test of time? Mm -hmm. And it's a very good question because my own view is that our budget process does have to change and probably has to change quite significantly in certain uh, aspects in order to adapt to the different environment that we are in right now, principally, not exclusively, but principally because of our additional tax uh, raising powers. Um, there's, a, there's a number of principles I think have to inform the work of the tripartite group. Uh, I guess if I was to uh, single out two, uh, it would be uh, transparency stroke scrutiny on the one hand and flexibility on the other. Now, th there will be a tension between those two. Uh, I'm very aware of that, and that's why the group's got quite a difficult job of work to do. Flexibility first, because when you have significant tax varying powers, there is, as, as we see through UK government budget processes every year, there is often a need to be able to act quickly uh, and to reduce the opportunity for forestalling, to, you know, to, to reduce the opportunity of, of people changing their behaviour to forestall on, on tax changes. That's why in, in a UK context, tax changes are, are very rarely announced far in advance. You know, there's, there's often a very short uh, time scale between announcement and implementation. So that, that's where the flexibility, I think, is important. Within that, there's also the need to make sure that the, the budget processes align with the, the, the scrutiny that the Fiscal Commission has to do in terms of giving uh, the government assurances and Parliament assurances around our, our fiscal projections. But on the other side of this, it's really important that Parliament still has proper scrutiny of our budget plans. I think that's been a hallmark of our budget process since the Parliament was 
uh, established. I know there has been, and believe it or not, the government shares some of the frustration about the, the constraining of that scrutiny last year because of uh, delays around the autumn budget statement, and again this year because of Brexit and a delayed autumn budget statement, that that has uh, constrained the time that Parliament's had to scrutinise the budget. So I think we have to, and as I say, um, I don't think it's going to be easy to come to perfect answers around this, but we've got to try and find a way of balancing the need uh, and the absolute you know, essential nature of parliamentary scrutiny and, and the transparency that government needs to have to enable that on the one hand, but giving government a bit more flexibility to take account of the fact that when you're responsible not just for a block, spending a block grant, but also raising a lot of that uh, money, then you just need to have a bit more flexibility in the timings around doing some of that. One of the things I've been... I, I just, bear, bear oh, with me, it has to be a short supplement. It has and to be I'm, also a short answer, please. Well, Thank you. As short as I can. Forestalling the behavioural effects were obviously in the land and buildings transaction mm -hmm. tax. Everybody can see that. Um, as far as the future is concerned, one of the things I've been privately thinking about, I've not shared this with the committee, we may have to separate out the day we set the draft budget from the day we set the taxations for the... For the, for, for the government, otherwise that forestalling of behavioural effect might well play. What's your view on that? Um, I think that is something that could well be considered. I, I'm, I'm slightly hesitant of, uh, of sitting here today and, and giving a, sort of a set of what might appear to be preconceived answers to this, because we've deliberately set up this process uh, in order to look properly at these things. But yes, I, I think that is something that probably should be looked at and, and may well be one of the ways in which we could balance those often competing principles that I spoke about. Thank you very much. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst, Committee of Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Mr Lindhurst, please. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, you will be aware of recent figures which suggest the relative underperformance of the Scottish economy compared to the wider UK economy. Um, to give my question context, referring to, for example, the JERS figures released late August show the public spending deficit in Scotland standing at 9.5% of GDP, which is more than double the UK figure of 4%. Uh, the report by PricewaterhouseCoopers published the beginning of this week, which shows that growth in the UK may be slowing in 2017, but it will be even slower in Scotland than the UK as a whole. The inward investment figures have been dropping in Scotland over the last few years, whereas the UK, for example, saw an 11% rise last year, some parts of the north of England a 24% increase, and the Scottish Government figures tell us that our business density is shrinking. Scotland now has only 768 enterprises per 10,000 people compared to the UK figure of 1,040. The numbers of small businesses in Scotland is 210 per 10,000 Can 10, I ask Mr Linders, the longer you speak, you're only going to get one question, so it's up to yes. you on behalf of your committee. Thank you. Um, what aspects of the programme for government will be changed to meet these challenges? Okay. Uh, firstly, in, in the long list of figures, I, I noticed that we didn't include the fact that registered businesses uh, were up by 15% since 2007, that Scotland's business R&D rose by 44% in real terms uh, from 2007, productivity is up by 4.4% since 2007 uh, compared to no growth whatsoever in the UK, or indeed this morning's unemployment figures, which show that unemployment is down again in Scotland and the unemployment rate is actually below uh, the UK unemployment rate. So I just put some of those stats uh, into, onto rather the record uh, to give a, a perhaps more balanced account uh, of the Scottish economy. All of that said, uh, we are, I am acutely aware of the continuing fragility in our economy, UK-wide, but also in Scotland. And, and, and the position in Scotland, of course, is exacerbated uh, by the challenges in the oil and gas sector, um, which uh, we, we are all aware of. Uh, in terms of the changes uh, we will make in the specific uh, initiatives that we will take, my programme for government at uh, the start of September announced, for example, the, the new growth scheme, which we are currently working to implement a £500 million uh, scheme over the next three years, specifically geared to help uh, small and medium-sized businesses with loans or uh, perhaps more often guarantees to help them uh, you know, with, with access to finance, to help them expand or, or move into new export markets. Uh, we've also already uh, in this financial year announced some capital acceleration to try to give some support, particularly around uh, the construction industry. Uh, we are, the Enterprise and Skills Review is about making sure that we are uh, 
targeting all of the effort of our enterprise and other uh, employment skills related agencies absolutely uh, on delivering our economic strategy. Uh, we will uh, continue to uh, make sure that the economic strategy, all aspects of that, particularly given post-Brexit, the internationalisation aspects of that. Uh, now, you mentioned inward investment. Uh, we remain, uh, as we have been for the last number of years, the, the best performing part of the UK outside of London for inward investment. But post-Brexit, we need to work uh, even harder at that, which is why we've announced plans to set up uh, innovation and investment hubs in uh, Dublin, Brussels and London. I recently announced that we would also do that in Berlin, uh, set up a new trade board within the Scottish Government to focus particularly on uh, increasing international trade with an emphasis in, on exports. So I could go on and on and on, but the, the convener will stop me. Uh, we are absolutely focused on making sure we're making the right interventions uh, to support our economy and to focus growth, sustainable growth in our economy. Obviously, we've you know, got a, a very hard focus on fair work as well. Uh, but, you know, let's be under no illusions. The Brexit vote, the uh, sheer recklessness of what the UK government is currently trying to inflict on is, uh, is a, a real and present risk, not just to the Scottish economy, but to the economy across the UK, uh, which is why I think uh, politicians that have put us into this position should be rather ashamed of themselves at the moment. I'm afraid there's no time for a supplementary. We'll cut other, uh, other conveners out of their time. I call Jenny Mara, convener of public audit and post legislative scrutiny. Ms Mara, please. Thank you. First Minister, as you know, the Public Audit Committee is responsible for scrutinising audit of the whole public sector across all portfolio areas. In my short time as convener since the election, the committee has already seen recurring themes across all areas. For example, governments struggling with major IT projects, how funding decisions contribute to the delivery of outcomes, governance issues and structural and organisational reform. With 17 years now of Audit Scotland reports and many, many conclusions being repeated year after year, is government learning the lessons from Audit Scotland's conclusions? Um, yes, I, I, I think we are. Obviously, that is also a very general question. Um, yes, we work very hard uh, to not only uh, learn the lessons but apply the lessons, lessons of Audit Scotland reports. Some Audit Scotland reports, by their very nature, that will be an ongoing uh, task in some respects. Uh, the themes you talk about, very uh, aware of, particularly around IT, we have uh, significant lessons to learn uh, from the experience over the CAP system, obviously, and uh, NHS 24 uh, system would be the two IT projects. And actually, there's a relationship between that and some of what I said to Sandra White in terms of the responsibility we have to put a, a delivery system in place for social security payments. So uh, there is a, a monumental amount of work uh, going on in the Scottish Government just now to make sure that those lessons are learned and applied. Uh, for the future. Similarly, with, uh, with governance and around performance, yes, we, we work hard and we work hard with Audit Scotland as well as within government to make sure that uh, lessons are, are learned and applied. Uh, I'm happy to be more specific on any particular aspect of that if, if you want, but that's the, the answer in general terms. I suppose, if I may, uh, President Officer, that the committee is looking for some reassurance that, you know, when we're looking at an education report or when we're looking at a health uh, Audit Scotland report, that these lessons aren't just being learned in that particular department, but the lessons about, say, for instance, the uh, IT projects you mentioned are actually, there's work going on across government um, because many of the problems with these IT projects are have very common themes. So is there work cross-cutting yes. going on across no, Absolutely, and that will be the case um, across very many different themes of Audit Scotland reports where it's not just, uh, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, some Audit Scotland reports and some recommendations will be very specific to a particular portfolio area. But where there are cross-cutting themes, and IT is a, an obvious example of that, but so too will other governance issues, then yes, there is an approach that is taken in governments to make sure that that cuts across different uh, policy and portfolio boundaries. And IT, I'm about to repeat what I said a moment ago, it, but it is the, the, the pertinent example at the moment of lessons that we have uh, you know, painfully had to learn around uh, CAP and NHS 24 and are, are still learning in uh, respect of both of these systems uh, already being applied in terms of other IT responsibilities. We've got principally uh, around the social security work we're doing just now, uh, which is why uh, part of the reason why we are being so adamant about taking uh, the time and going through the right processes to make sure we get that right at every step of the way. 
Thank you. Uh, Christina McKelvey, Convener of Equality and Human Rights. Ms McKelvey, please. Thank you very much, Pre President. Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, you'll know that the Equality and Human Rights Committee is a former Equal Opportunities Committee with some new and additional remit points given the devolution of equality duties to the, this, this place. Um, and that gives us lots of really good opportunities. And I, I know um, from your personal commitment to many of um, the expansion and equality um, it, policy across lots of areas in Scotland, especially across many of our protected characteristics, is something that, that you've been very vocal on. But could you maybe give us some idea, and I know that there's a, the, the um, Gender Balance and Public Boards Bill is in your legislative programme, so you can maybe tell us a wee bit about this, but is there anything else, either through policy or legislation, where you would see Scotland expanding and taking much further, actually, than maybe uh, other legislators where, where we um, you know, really underpin, but entrench and make equalities intrinsic to everything that this place does? Um, I think, well, for, firstly, I, I don't think we should ever uh, tell ourselves that we've got it all right or that there's nothing we can learn from elsewhere. We, we look uh, all the time at, at lessons we can learn from other parliaments in other countries, and you know, there are some uh, you know, great examples of, of where we have... Uh, look to other countries and decide to learn. The baby box that we're about to introduce, for example, is, is one relatively small but quite important example of a policy we've taken from Finland, uh, which the evidence says has been instrumental in reducing uh, infant mortality and improving the health of, of, of children and, and mothers. So the introduction of that, and, and not just the physical box, but all that will go around that is going to be an important aspect there. Uh, gender balance, I think, is another area which I think you you mentioned where I think we are going further than other governments, certainly in the UK, in terms of, well, we're about to legislate for gender balance on public boards. We, we don't have the power to do it for private companies, but the 50-50 by 2020 campaign that I started is about encouraging private sector boards to sign up to uh, gender equality. I think um, we, we can also look with some pride at our Fair Work Agenda, the, the Fair Work Convention, uh, you know, where certain other parts of the UK seem to see trade unions as enemies uh, and opponents. Uh, we see trade unions very much as our partners in trying to build a, a a stronger, more productive, more sustainable economy, and that's encapsulated in the Fair Work Convention, but underpinning that is the work we're doing around the living wage, uh, the business pledge, making progressive workplace practices, not just uh, policies that are socially good, but policies that are understood to be economically uh, advantageous as well. So there's, there's a whole range of things. Um, childcare is another one. The, report earlier in the week that said that the single most important policy in, in terms of improving equality in Scotland is expanding childcare, which underlines our determination uh, to make the transformational change that we have said we'll make uh, throughout this parliament. So I think there's a lot of good work we're doing in Scotland and, and there's a lot of international interest in some of the work we're doing around uh, these agendas, but you know, we should always be uh, alert to examples from elsewhere that we can apply here. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about learning from, from others uh, as well. And there's lots of things that you've mentioned there that will we'll take forward the equalities agenda. There's also things that we need to do. And we heard some evidence at our committee a few weeks ago from Tobias Locke from Edinburgh University um, about not being complacent about the things that we already have. And, and some of that being, you know, the very good record we have on welcoming people, on, you know, our anti-discriminatory practice and policies that we have. Um, I wonder if you give us some of your insight in the backdrop to Brexit, the backdrop to a possible repeal of the a Human Rights mm. Act and a possible then withdrawal from the ECHR, how you would see this government, not even just this government, this parliament advancing um, the, the causes of um, ensuring that we don't have racism, we don't have homophobic bullying, that we don't have some of the, the pretty nasty stuff that we've seen has went on in the past few months, that we ensure that we don't become complacent and we push all of that forward and we become a bit, bit of a beacon uh, in that respect. I said, First Minister, the same applies to Ms McKell, as applies to Mr Lindhurst, very long, thrown into a question, very short time. Okay, I, I will be, please, please, please. I think one of the lessons of the last few months, um, without going into too much detail, is that that there's no room for complacency. Mm -hmm. we, sh we should never and can never take for granted that progress in any area is irreversible. Um, and you know, some of what we saw in the aftermath of Brexit, some of what I, I, I read perhaps has been seen in certain parts of America in the last week in terms of racist uh, and anti-Semitic attacks 
uh, or abuse, you know, that should never be tolerated. And I think it is a reminder that we've always got to work for these values and we've always got to work to uh, not just protect, but continue to make progress on some of these issues. And, you know, just last sentence, uh, convener, getting rid of the uh, Human Rights Act or, you know, coming out of the ECHR in any way would be a huge backward step uh, as far as all of this is concerned, which is why I will do everything I can to oppose that. Thank you very much. Uh, Graeme Day, Convener of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Mr Day, please. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, evidence received by the committee over recent weeks has identified what it would consider as a potential gap in data gathering and the evidence base in relation to flooding. It appears that where SEPA as a statutory consultee objects to a plan and application because of flooding concerns and consent is nevertheless granted, no one has responsibility for monitoring whether, if the development goes ahead, any issues arise. Now, to, to give an idea of the numbers involved annually, in 2015, of 22 applications, SEPA opposed nine were granted. And of course, it doesn't automatically follow that such developments go ahead or go ahead without mitigation conditions attached. Nonetheless, it does strike the committee that someone, be it SEPA, the local authorities, should have responsibility for assessing what consequences, if any, arise to improve the understanding of flooding situations that might reasonably have been avoided. And for example, the advisability of building on known floodplains. I just wonder what your views are on that. Um, I mean, it's an important issue, and uh, I think the, the concern you're expressing is that there, there is, is a gap in terms of how the evidence is gathered, where SEPA has objected to something, but it's gone ahead anyway, and mm. the, the evidence is not gathered about whether SEPA's uh, concerns were founded yeah. or not. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to ask the Chief Planner to give some consideration to how the process can uh, you know, look at that and see whether there is a, a particular gap that, that needs to be filled there. I'm just... Without uh, sounding as if I don't think it's an issue, because it, it clearly is an issue we should address, we probably, on the other hand, should be slightly cautious about overstating the, the scale of, of that problem. I mean, there'd be two points that may be worth making here. That, you know, in terms of planning applications just now, planning policy in Scotland already ensures that those making the decisions take a precautionary approach to flood risk and they've got to apply the flood risk uh, framework when they arrive at decisions. So the risk of flooding is uh, an inherent part of uh, planning decision making. Uh, the second point, which is perhaps of relevance here, is that if a planning application uh, receives an approval while there is a SEPA objection remaining in place, then that's got to be referred to ministers. So there's, almost, there's a kind of belt and braces approach there. And as far as I'm aware, I, I, I can double check these figures, but. Uh, there's only a small number of such applications. I, I think this might actually, I think you said nine or something, but my information here is that there's only, a, in the last four years, it's been about seven and nine of those kind of applications have come to ministers uh, a year. So I, I would suggest that the system probably overall works well, um, but you know, as we saw at the turn of this year, the impact of flooding is so severe that we've you know, got to make sure that we are uh, properly learning all of these lessons. So um, you know, without going into more detail of, of the gap that your concern might exist, I, I will ask the Chief Planner to look at that and uh, report back to your committee. Okay. Thank you. I have a second question. Sign officer, thank you. Um, throughout the work that's been done by the committee thus far, which has largely covered climate change and biodiversity, one theme keeps cropping up, and that's the importance of implementing the updated land use strategy. Stakeholders, as well as the committee members, see a fully functioning strategy being integral to climate change adaptation and mitigation and meeting the challenges facing Scotland's biodiversity. I wonder whether that's a view you share, First Minister, and if you would outline how the Scottish Government intends to deliver on the promise of the revised strategy. Well, the, the new land use strategy, which runs from this year to 2021, was published in March. Uh, there's obviously a reporting framework around that strategy, and I, I think we're due to publish uh, before the end of the year how we, we plan to report on progress, so that will be central uh, to that. Uh, the strategy itself obviously has got specific climate change commitments in it, um, package of measures around uh, farming and crofting, uh, work to consider how the Scottish uplands can contribute mm. to climate change targets and uh, material around uh, forestry. I think it's also important in the land use strategy because I think it does have a really important part to play in 
in tackling climate change is how uh, communities are involved in decisions that affect land. And uh, as you, you know, the strategy encourages the formation of uh, regional land yeah. use partnerships. So I think you know, the, the framework that's been put in place there is important to uh, the, the question that uh, you're asking. But absolutely, land use, the land use strategy is uh, a vital tool if we're going to meet the challenges uh, posed by climate change mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Uh, Edward Mountain, Convener of Rural Economy and Connectivity. Mr Mountain, please. Good afternoon, First Minister. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee has already taken evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, quite a few times during this session regarding farm payments. The committee still remain concerned about the issue, especially, especially in light of the fact that a loan is going to have to be made to cover the 2016 payments and that the wrong area calculations was made to some farmers relating this loan. We therefore would like some indication from you that you are satisfied that all is being done and specifically to resolve the issues relating to the explanation for the 2015 payments and also the timescale as when to the final 20% of the 2016 payments are going to be made. Okay, I mean, obviously, Fergus Ewing uh, has previously, and uh, I, it's worth putting on the record again, that we deeply regret the, the, the problems around the cap payment system and, and the anxiety that that has caused uh, our farming community. And we are determined uh, that we will do what needs to be done to put it right and to get the system onto a sound footing for, for next year. Just in terms of uh, where we are with the 2015 payments, Fergus Ewing has uh, updated uh, Parliament already, but 99.9% .9 of payments uh, have now been made to over 18,000 businesses worth more than £300 million. Uh, there are some uh, claims outstanding, uh, but the, the tail of remaining payments now is, you know, on, on a similar scale to what we would be dealing with in a normal year in terms of some of the, which undoubtedly will be some of the more complex payments. Uh, there are still challenges that are, are cropping up. For example, uh, there have been a small number of overpayments made in 2015, which uh, work has been done to, to rectify uh, that. So there are still challenges there, but 99.9% but .9 of those payments for 2015 have been made. Uh, and we met the extended EU deadline for payments of the 15th of October. Before we know whether or not there will be any penalties, we need to know whether the UK as a whole uh, met that deadline. Uh, and we're waiting for confirmation from the UK government about whether uh, there's member state compliance as a whole. Uh, in terms of the, the future, obviously we uh, are, are determined uh, to learn the lessons of this year to get the system uh, onto the footing that would be expected for next year. We've got assurances from the contractor that the IT system functionality for 2016 will be delivered early next year. Uh, the final processing of applications for payment uh, will be undertaken thereafter uh, and we uh, anticipate that 2016 payments will be made uh, and substantially completed between then and by the end of the payment period. The end of the payment period, of course, being June 2017. Uh, we have, of course, put in place the loan uh, scheme for 2016 uh, and uh, a significant uh, amount of money to, I think, around about 12,000 uh, farmers have already been made uh, through that uh, loan scheme and that, that work continues. So I, I don't underestimate the, the difficulties and the, the anxiety this has caused our farming community, uh, but equally I hope members don't underestimate the amount of work that rightly the government is doing to make sure we put these issues right. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I th uh, the committee would also like to know how it can scrutinise the uh, issues here, because one of the fundamental issues is understanding all the problems. And as yet we haven't had sight of what all the problems are or an explanation of them. Could the committee have an undertaking from the First Minister that once all the problems have been identified, we can then scrutinise the solutions to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Uh, in short, yes. I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot of work. Now, what, what we focused on, and I, I hope members will think this is, is the right focus, uh, particularly around the 2015 scheme, has been to get the payments to farmers. Uh, obviously, as we go along, we are learning lessons. There will no doubt be further reviews that we choose to do internally in government to make sure that all those lessons have been learned and applied. It's obviously entirely open to your committee to undertake whatever review it, it wants to take, and the Thank government you. will fully uh, cooperate with, with any review. Um, the uh, Cabinet Secretary is and will continue to keep Parliament updated on progress, and I'm um, very happy to ask the Cabinet Secretary to have a direct discussion with you about how the committee uh, can be fully 
uh, fully appraised of so that it can perform adequate scrutiny of all of the issues that have been identified, how they're being or have been resolved so that there can be the fullest possible transparency and scrutiny around that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Lamont, Convener of Public Petitions. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much. Um, I have to confess, uh, First Minister, that given the eclectic nature of the Public Petitions Committee, I was rather test um, tempted to test the depth and uh, breadth of your briefing. But, but you're not going to. I resisted the temptation to allow you to show us just how much you knew about sea lice. Um, well, actually... Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And that was why I was going to resist it. I, I guess that you probably knew too much was wholly healthy for you. Um, and really, I suppose, first of all, just to say that the Public Petitions Committee is clearly public driven and that it, therefore by its very nature is revealing the passions and interests of people right across our communities. And I know that the Scottish Government takes um, the, the role seriously in terms of responding to that. But one of the issues that does come up fairly regularly um, is around the question of health, the role of local communities in terms of health and how change is made. Um, and one of the things that I think comes up quite often in petitions is, what is the role and responsibilities of Scottish ministers in, th in making those changes? What are minor changes and what is a major change? And maybe we're not surprised since all of us as politicians are very good at turning up at the opening of things, but tend to disappear when things have been closed. But I wonder whether um, you recognise that in terms of dealing with communities and changing uh, services, there is an issue about people understanding specifically what the role of Scottish ministers are and are you looking at perhaps finding ways of um, improving guidance or public information about the actual where responsibility lies? Um, well firstly yes I, I do recognise it and I've got a lot of um, I suppose personal experience of, of, of that as health secretary of um, you know over a number of years on a number of different issues uh, appreciating you know, how difficult local health service changes can be uh, and how understandably uh, confusing it can be at times for the public and patients affected to understand uh, how the system works and who takes what decisions uh, and, and what level uh, of, of decision making is appropriate in, in their particular case. We, we have done a lot of work in terms of the role of the Scottish Health Council, uh, trying to simplify some of the guidance. Obviously, it's been a an issue uh, of debate in the Parliament recently about the process that local changes go through from the, the, the point at which they are first discussed by a health board through you know, initial public consultation to formal consultation to a decision which the Scottish Health Council is involved in about whether something is major service change, in which case it has to come to a minister or not. Uh, so, you know, on paper, that looks like quite a, a straightforward process. Obviously, in practice, it can be anything but because, and this, you know, this, this is the difficult bit of it, but I entirely understand this, is if, if you're a patient and a service you uh, value and rely on is being proposed for change of any nature, the system might not deem it major change, but to you it's major change because it's a service you rely on. So I guess what I'm saying is that I don't know that we'll always ever find the perfect way of, of dealing with some of those difficult changes, but we've got a responsibility to try to make that system as open, as accessible and as understandable to people as possible. And you know, we, we, we try to do that on an ongoing basis. There was a number of changes to those systems made from memory when I was Health Secretary. Um, I think there have been changes made since. Uh, no doubt you know, some of uh, the, the debates that are we're having in Parliament just now around some of this will lead to further reflection and possibly further changes in the future. Yeah, I wonder if you, you recognise the fear that people have, the temptation to deem something to be minor, um, a minor change, and therefore it's not going to have the level of scrutiny that would be otherwise associated in people who want to resist it. And also, how do you, understandably, things have to change and evolve, but there are also pressures in budgets and there are cuts. How do you have, find an honesty around which is which, because clearly it may be necessary to change the health service, but if you're doing it in the context of cuts to budgets at the same time, it can, you can justify somebody or explain away something um, to somebody in terms of the service they've got because it's, it's service change as opposed to actually pressures in the service. Well, the, the challenge for us is, is to, to, to try to make sure that ch if changes have been made to services, they've been made not for cost reasons, but for clinical reasons. And that's why 
Again, it's not popular. It, it can be very difficult for those responsible for delivering this, but we do have an efficiency uh, requirement on health boards because we need to make sure public money is being used efficiently so that we, we do have uh, a situation where we're, we're reforming the health service in a way that is, is right for the clinical needs of, of the service. I, I do accept there are a whole range of issues. It's, it's why I think the role of the Scottish Health Council in this whole process is so important because, you know, they should be free to comment on the, the reasons perceived or otherwise for changes. There is maybe an issue around terminology, major or uh, minor, you know, these, that perhaps doesn't quite sum up the, you know, because major and minor doesn't mean important and unimportant. It, it obviously has a different meaning to that, so there's maybe issues around there. Uh, so I, I recognise that the responsibilities for government here, and they're not easy, and they'll never be easy with the health service. I don't think any government in history, and no doubt no government in the future, will find these things easy. But, you know, I'll say this reasonably uh, gently, given uh, that I'm at your mercy here, but there is a responsibility on opposition... Cole there, I'll be careful. There is a responsibility on opposition as well. Um, and that, yeah, if, if there is a perception that cuts, that, that cuts are cuts and changes are being made for purely financial reasons, opposition have got a role to play in saying that's wrong. But equally, I think there's a, a responsibility in opposition not always to say that that's the case and to recognise that some changes are about the evolution, the, the correct evolution of the health service. And that's going to be a challenge for all of us over the next few years. Okay. I'll leave the sea lice I, I, for later. Yes, you leave the water well, to later? Sea lice. I'm disappointed. The officials yeah. that prepared if my only, sea lice. If only we had time, we're all intrigued. It was a live Are we, get, are we getting on to beavers? So oh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> no. I now move on uh, to Bob Doris, convener of local government and communities. Mr okay. Doris, please. Okay, First Minister, my question is referred to sea lice. <laughs> no, no, they don't. Um, uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, the Local Government Communities Committee has been scrutinising Scottish Government budgets and funds across local authority areas. We're finding it increasingly fragmented and we're finding it more complex to scrutinise. And I give two brief examples, but important ones. The £250 million Health and Social Care Integration Fund that come through a health origin but find its way to local authority priorities and the £100 million Educational Attainment Fund, which is going to be rolled out in the next financial year. So they're child to local authority areas, but they don't show up in a re revenue support grant for local authorities, but they have to be scrutinised and scrutinised appropriately. Uh, can I ask what impact do you think uh, this fragmentation has on the statutory duties of health, uh, sorry, of social work and education within local authority areas? Does it tackle some of the cost pressures in relation to it? And is anyone in government looking at the totality of spend in a local authority area? Because our committee is determined to, to do that, irrespective of how the funds are channelled into uh, local authorities. Um, yes, we, we do look at the totality of spend, not just in terms of local government, but across other areas. And I'm happy, uh, you know, if, if a discussion with officials to, to look at how that's done in government would help your committee's consideration, I'm happy to, to facilitate that. I do think you raise an issue here, though, that, that, that is quite a, an important but inevitable issue. As we reform public services, and the £250 million that you talk about going from health to social care... Is, is not a sort of financial transaction in isolation. It's, it's the financial part of quite a significant reform to how health and social care services are being delivered. Uh, and that budget transfer is, is sort of trying to support that reform. Similarly with education, as we you know, have developed our plans around attainment and tackling the attainment gap, we've developed uh, funding streams to support that. So as we uh, reform public services, there will be a sort of inevitable, perhaps, change in the budget streams that support that. What we've got to, to work with committees to do, and, and I know you know the, the finance committee, and uh, year after year after year, you know, explores and interrogates the compatibility of budget numbers and the ability to scrutinise them. We've got to make sure that the the ability to scrutinise and the ability to to know the impact of of that spend is there for committees. So we, you know, that's probably an area where there is some further discussion that we we need to have. And in terms of health and social care, obviously, a lot of uh, the, the, well, the, the impact of that is going to be in the work that's been done by joint uh, integration boards. Um, and in terms of how the government uh, scrutinises that performance and as, as well as, as the parliament, we need to make sure that we get those systems right. Okay. Would you recommend Very briefly. that 72% of all social work budgets will now sit within integrated health and social care? 
uh, funds going forward and you put into the mix the £250 million, how do we know that £250 million will not be used to mitigate existing pressures within the system and will give additional value? Because that's something our committee would be keen to tease out. Well, no, that's, that's a good point. And, you know, last year when that decision was made about the £250 million, there was a discussion uh, with COSLA about the extent to which uh, that money, you know, could help deal with with pressures from rising demand, which, which needs to be done, but also how it could genuinely be building capacity in social care. And from memory, I may be getting this wrong, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's correspondence that is available to the committee. Uh, that was uh, split 125, 125 around that particular budget. There was also uh, provision made there to support the living wage for social care workers' commitments. So there was a lot of, of detail around exactly how that budget was going to work. Similarly with the attainment fund, uh, there's a, agreements effectively between uh, the government and local authorities about what's going to be supported through the attainment fund that allow us to ensure that that money is additional spend and isn't just substituting spend elsewhere. So, you know, the government does a lot of work around that. I, I'm pretty sure most of it will be available to your committee, but I'm more than happy to ask officials to have a discussion with the committee officials just to make sure that we're, we're providing as much information as possible around it. Okay, thank thank you. you. Claire Adamson, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and good afternoon, First Minister. I guess it's um, uh, been second last uh, to, to ask the question today. Both of the questions I have for you this afternoon have already been mentioned briefly. Um, if I could ask you, um, my um, colleague uh, Christina McKelvey mentioned the Gender Balance and Public Boards Bill, and given uh, the SS. SPPA's committee's role in scrutinising public appointments. I was wondering if you could give us any timescales for the introduction of that bill and what discussions, if any, have taken place with the Commissioner of Ethical Standards and Public Life regarding it. Uh, the Gender Balance Public Boards uh, is, is a year one uh, bill, as you know. Uh, so we are consulting on the draft bill later this autumn and the bill is scheduled to be introduced uh, formally to Parliament before the summer recess. Um, you know, I think it's a really important bill. It, it, it is narrow in the sense that it only deals with public boards, but the message it sends and the symbolism in terms of wider society, I think, is an important one. Um, there uh, will be discussions uh, in terms of the development of the consultation in the bill with the, the Commissioner. Um, I'm happy to you know, get officials to write to your committee to detail exactly what those discussions are or are intended to be and how they will influence the, the final uh, contents of the bill. Thank you very much, First Minister. Um, there has been a bit of discussion about the role of committees and um, differing views, I would say, about the effectiveness of the committees at the moment. But the um, presiding officer has announced his independent um, commission on parliamentary reform um, with a remit that the commission is looking at the, how the parliament can be assured that it's the right checks and balances in place for effective conduct of parliamentary business increase its engagement with wider society and the public and clarify its, ad its identity as distinct from the Scottish Government. And I just wondered if you could give us, uh, it's already been mentioned, uh, uh, as I said, but um, just an indication of how the Government will be engaging with that Commission process. We'll engage with it as, as closely as the Commission wants us to engage with it. Um, I mean, I've, got, I've got lots of views on how uh, all of that can be achieved. Uh, and the first thing I would say is, I think we've got to be careful, and I know the presiding officer is, is conscious of this, in, in having a commission like this, which I think is absolutely the right thing for him to have done, but not somehow given a suggestion that the parliament's not working, because I think the parliament is working, and I think it works very well. I can tell you, as First Minister, it feels as if it works reasonably well in terms of holding the government uh, to account. But there are areas in which that can be uh, improved. Uh, so we all engage constructively. Um, I'm also conscious of the fact, though, that almost by definition, a government shouldn't you know, overly influence how a parliament decides to conduct itself because that's for parliament to decide. Um, I've been, you know, immediately after the election, I made uh, two particular suggestions about how I thought uh, the accountability of government could be improved. Uh, one of which, of course, which I'm not sure yet whether I regret or not, was the lengthening of First Minister's <laughs> questions, um, which is now a, a formal change to standing orders. Um, and the second was to appear before this uh, forum more regularly. So these are just two ways in which, as government, we've made suggestions. Um, there'll be other suggestions, no doubt, we will make, but I think it's right that, that Parliament as a whole comes to these conclusions uh, without undue influence of government. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much. I uh, now call uh, John Scott. Last but not least, Mr Scott, Convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, in its legacy report on the Session 4 Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee expressed concern about the increasing number of so-called framework bills which were brought forward between 2011 and 2016. These, as you know, are bills which confer wide-ranging power on ministers with little information as to how these powers are to be exercised and include few details on the face of the bill. The Session 4 DPLR Committee expressed its dissatisfaction with this approach because it means Parliament is being asked to delegate powers to Scottish ministers without knowing how those powers are to be exercised. Can you give some assurance, please, that this approach to legislating will not be one that will become common practice in this session? Um, I, I know there, there was a concern expressed previously. What I, I can say, um, and, and this may be a, a matter of opinion here, but it's certainly my opinion, and, but it's also an assurance about the future, is there's no trend towards an increased use of, of framework bills. They, they continue to have a place. Um, they, they provide the ability for uh, a bill to provide a, a broad legislative framework with some finer detail to be uh, filled in later on. And you know, that will often be appropriate where flexibility <coughs> to change procedures and processes is required and where you know, if those changes required further primary legislation, that would be disproportionate and would you know, unfairly impact on the time of, of Parliament. Uh, two, two points I would make. Firstly, for framework bills, uh, they provide the broad framework and then further detail is done through secondary legislation. Secondary subordinate legislation also has to be approved by Parliament, so it's not, it doesn't give carte blanche to ministers uh, to fill in the detail. There is a parliamentary process that has to be gone through and you know, I, I don't think we should... Uh, I tell you my experience of uh, the legislative process over 10 years, it's sometimes the secondary legislative process that can be trickier than the primary uh, legislative process, no doubt uh, because of the, the scrutiny that your uh, predecessor committees have applied. Uh, so it's not about giving ministers carte blanche, it is a, uh, providing the detail through a, a different parliamentary process. Um, and the second point I would make is we will not overuse framework legislation if you or your committee or indeed any uh, committee has concerns about particular bills, um, I know in the last session I think the concerns were around the land reform and the community empowerment bills. Uh, if there are particular bills uh, coming up where there's a concern that they, they, they go too much to the framework uh, side of things, we will be happy to discuss that with the, the relevant committees. Well, I thank you for your answer, and you're absolutely right in saying that the land reform, community empowerment, burial and cremation and the regulatory reform bills were all bills that gave our committee uh, grounds for concern. But I thank you for your answer, but you will be aware, uh, you mentioned specifically land reform, you will be aware that there are 47 pieces of subordinate legislation to be brought forward with regard to the land reform bill, with policy development still ongoing in some areas. And notwithstanding your answer, will you personally ensure that in future better developed policy intentions will be on the face of the bill in this session? And will you ask your Cabinet colleagues to ensure this happens? Uh, in short, yes. That, that does not mean there will not be framework legislation. I mean, you, you, you say there's 47, uh, I will take your, your word if there is 47 uh, pieces of subordinate legislation. I, I suppose just to, to flip this to the other side, if, if, all, if the content of all 47 pieces of subordinate legislation had been on the face of that bill, we'd probably still be debating it on the floor of, of Parliament. So this is about a balance between you know, good use of parliamentary time, but also making sure appropriate scrutiny. So it, it will always be a balance. Um, I was laughing there because just before I came down, I, I read something, and I, I only read it briefly, so I don't know if it's true, that there has been a suggestion today that the Great Repeal Bill uh, for Brexit will involve 2,000 pieces of subordinate legislation. Um, so if that's true, it, it suggests that no matter how bad you think this government might be at these matters, it is as nothing compared to what might be facing the House of Commons. But, I mean, seriously, it is a serious point, and I, I will give you the undertaking that I will... Uh, feedback to officials that they should always be mindful of trying their best to strike that balance in the right place. And as ministers, we will always be mindful about trying to strike that balance in the right place as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That concludes questions. I don't know if First Minister you want to make any brief closing remarks. 
Uh, no, I think it's exhausted. wonderful the conveners but, uh, are. I was just going to read out my briefing on sea lice, if that was okay, <laughs> for the, the remaining few minutes. Uh, well, no, thank, thank you very much. For thank you very much for attendance. And I thank the conveners who've kept your time, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. I close the meeting.